Across the globe, across America, communities, cultures, institutions, and governments face challenges and confront tremendous change and search for opportunity and new ideas within the struggle. Then there's California. Then there's California, a new podcast featuring members of the California State Senate Democratic Caucus discussing legislative priorities and policy and other related issues that make California unique. From the state capitol in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green, and to launch this new podcast called Then There's California, I cannot think of a better topic to focus on at the outset than discussing California's complicated up-and-down past and 21st century resurgence and what that means for our country's future. And I cannot think of a more appropriate person to join me in this discussion a state lawmaker who personifies California's resurgence for the future, but who has been an eyewitness to the challenges of California in decades past. Proud to have with me State Senator Holly Mitchell of Los Angeles, chair of the Senate Budget Committee. Brian, it's indeed my honor. Thank you so much for allowing me to to share the microphone with you, if I may, uh, for this inaugural podcast. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate you being the one to break the champagne bottle on the on the bow of the ship. So tell us who our guest is this first time around. So to launch this podcast and what we hope will be an ongoing discussion about California's policies, impact, action, resistance, and change, I am proud to have joining us today Dr. Manuel Pastor, a professor of sociology, American studies, and ethnicity at the University of Southern California, which I'm proud to say is in the 30th Senate District and my mother's alma mater. Dr. Pastor is the author of a new book called State of Resistance, What California's Dizzying Descent and Remarkable Resurgence Means for America's Future. Dr. Pastor joins us by phone from his office at USC. Professor? So glad to be with you. We are very glad to have you here. Both of us have read this book, and when I read it, one of the first things was, I I, want to give this book to Senator Holly Mitchell. And she loved it, and she sent me a note back. Do you know what? You and I ought to interview Dr. Pastor sometime. And I thought, what a great idea. So here we are. I love it when a plan comes together. And I appreciate you, Brian. It did cause a little ruckus on the floor when the sergeants brought me my gift of the book to the floor because all of my green-eyed, jealous colleagues wanted to know, well, who's giving you a book and what's the book? I told them, don't worry about it. Now, having read it, I have to go back, Dr. Pastor, and tell them it's a book you all have to read. Uh, And let me just say off the top, I think it should truly be required reading for anyone who intends to run for office in California and those who study political science. As an old poli-sci major myself, I remember being disappointed in my first couple of classes because it was ancient history. I thought, I'm studying poli-sci to understand the factors that contribute to public policy decisions on a go-forward basis. And, you know, as a young woman, as many of us, I was impatient with the ancient history lessons as I perceived them then. Your book, however, gives us history, but it's still within our lifetimes. It it was a walk down memory lane for me to really fully appreciate how far we've come. We throw that old adage around, as goes California, as goes the rest of the world. But as you outline in your book, that really is true. You know, the origins of the book are interesting. As you might expect, it was prompted by an election. But in fact, it was not prompted by the election most people think. It was prompted by the election in 2008 of President Barack Obama, when a lot of people who were progressive or wanted social change wound up sort of rushing to Washington, thinking that they could change things in Washington, when really what they should have done is rush back to communities Mm -hmm. to do the kind of digging in and long-term community organizing, social movement building that could have provided wind to Obama's sales when he was right, Mm -hmm. or held him accountable when he was wrong. Mm -hmm. So I actually started this book trying to think about the fact that we needed to build a 50-state progressive grassroots infrastructure for change. And then the 2016 election happened. And there's some really eerie parallels. If you think about California in the early 1990s, Prop 187 passed in 1994 Mm -hmm. as a result of anti-immigrant hysteria that then bled its way into the elimination of affirmative action, elimination of bilingual education, three strikes laws, etc. So California was marked by tremendous racial anxiety. Similarly, in the early 1990s, half 
of the country's net job losses mm -hmm. occurred in California. And you, as a representative from South Los Angeles, mm -hmm. know this all too well because of the deindustrialization that occurred in that core of Los Angeles and devastated so many economic lives in the black and other communities in California. And then people forget that Rush Limbaugh mm -hmm. began his talk radio career in Sacramento in the late 1980s, and that a series of you know radio talk show hosts peddling racism and hate sort of made their way through Southern California in the early 1990s as well. So that sort of perfect stew of demographic anxiety, economic uncertainty, and profiteering from political polarization we did it first in California. And, and deja vu all over again. Here we're experiencing it now on a national level. Indeed. And so what we really wanted to ask was, what was it that sort of turned California from those very difficult days into becoming a kind of bastion of resistance? And those are the main themes that we tried to explore in the book. You refer to, uh, it was a term I highlighted in the book, to racial propositions. I thought that was very profound, and you just touched on that. You want to expand upon that a little more? And I think, you know, California is unique among most states in the country in that we have a referendum on the ballot that non-elected officials can qualify a referendum to vote on. And many, as I recall, of those racial propositions did come to bear just that way. Yeah, and, you know, they came to bear in a very particular period of time. The demographic change in California between 1980 and 2000 is the demographic change that the United States is going through between 2000 and 2050. Mm. So California, economically, in terms of creativity and high tech, but also in terms of its demographics, is America fast forward. And so beneath Prop 187 was not a debate about immigration. It was an anti-immigrant and anti-Mexican sentiment mm -hmm. taking kind of its its space around immigration, much like the child separation policies that mm -hmm. we're witnessing from the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. That's not about immigration policy. Mm -hmm. That's about dehumanizing other people. Similarly, the elimination of affirmative action and an issue that's been very dear to your organizing heart, the way in which California went kind of crazy on incarceration. Between 1978 and 2008, the state prison population in the rest of the United States went up threefold. In California, it went up sixfold. And the rates, particularly for black men, for Latinos as well, were quite striking with respect to the racialization of that incarcerated population. What was driving that? A fear of the other, the kind of racial anxiety bubbling over. And one of the central messages that we're trying to lift up from this book is, particularly after the last election, when Hillary Clinton lost and Donald Trump won, there was a lot of discussion in the mainstream Democratic Party about, oh my gosh, should we focus on race or should we focus on class? And the real key thing that we're trying to lift up in the book is you can't even get to the economic issues that bedevil us unless you deal with the race and racism Absolutely. that obscure people from being able to focus in on their common ground issues. Right. In the book, you talk about California has really a responsibility to spread the message in, in, in ways both symbolic and concrete, including working to export good policy today as much as it exported bad policy in the past. And so... Talk to me a little bit about some of those bad policies we have a responsibility to, to reverse. Well, you know, we forget that it's the tax-cutting fervor of Proposition 13 in 1978 that then rippled across the country in the form of tax-cut initiatives and actually gave fuel to Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign in 1980, where he promised to do to the United States in terms of tax cuts what had been done in California. He came to power, and indeed, he blew a gigantic hole in the deficit that it then took Democrats years to repair. And then we exported our anti-affirmative action campaigns to other states. We exported our infatuation with incarceration and criminalization to other states. And, of course, the anti-immigrant sentiments that were bundled up in Prop 187 mm -hmm. eventually found bloom in places like Alabama and Georgia mm -hmm. later. So we've exported lots of bad ideas. Mm -hmm. But in the last 25 years, California is one of the first two states to raise its minimum wage to mm -hmm. $15 an hour, mm -hmm. proudly declared itself to be a 
sanctuary state, has begun the process of deincarceration. It's imperfect. We need to put a lot more resources into reentry to make sure that deincarceration is successful. We've led on climate and dealing with climate change and bringing into that climate justice as well, making sure that communities that have been overexposed and socially vulnerable are going to get their share of the cap and trade revenues. So in many ways, we've kind of led and pointed to another kind of uh, future. We still have big problems. We can talk about that. But what we try to say in the book is that the responsibility of California now is to defend, develop, and deploy, to defend some of these policies against an overreaching federal government that wants to make our police cooperate with ICE or wants to turn the page on the criminal justice reforms we've put in place, to push the policy envelope even further on good progressive ideas, things like making sure that undocumented Californians can access health insurance, that we actually do have a safety net, again, an issue that you've been working on for many years, that actually allows people to be able to succeed, that we reinvest in education, particularly community colleges, that's so important, particularly for people of color reentering the labor market. So we need to develop, but we also need to deploy. We need to make sure that the good ideas that we've got in California move out to other states, and that we actually need to figure out how to kind of co-organize with people in Nevada and Arizona and Colorado and other states that are going to be really essential to turning the nation around. We are talking with Professor Manuel Pastor here on our podcast, Then There's California, with State Senator Holly Mitchell and me, Brian Green. Uh, Professor Pastor is a professor of sociology at USC. And, Professor, one of the key elements here is that you say California worked best when we all had a social compact with each other, when we all got along. And that translated into infrastructure investments and economy that created opportunity. And really, that is the key to what worked or didn't work in the past here in California and also for the future. You want to elaborate on that? I I agree. And the other element that I took away from the book was really looking back at our boom period. And you talked about you know, in the early 60s, when there was truly a multi-generational commitment to the future, that everybody was on board singing the same song about building California's infrastructure. And out of that, we got our higher ed master plan of 1960. From your perspective, what should the next investment be? We are on the precipice of the fall election with an incoming administration that some would argue doesn't necessarily have the baggage good or bad, of the current administration having served previously. I think Governor Brown felt an obligation and responsibility to do some cleanup work, and we've seen that in his criminal justice reform work. The new administration won't be a former governor, won't have some of those other issues to contend with. So what should the next administration focus on from your perspective? Gosh, what a great set of questions. So first, we do argue in the book that California worked in many ways in the 1950s and 1960s. We don't want to paint too pretty a picture. Those of us who grew up in that era in California remember the racial discrimination in both labor markets and in housing markets. But at the same time, you know, it was a state that was uh, investing in its future, in which I know my family came in the 1950s from New York and Even with all of the challenges, it felt like there was tremendous opportunity in California. And it was a state that was both welcoming newcomers in and was actually investing in the next generation. What did that look like? It looked like investments in infrastructure in that era that was water expansion and also transit, mostly via highways. We were creating housing that could house the next generation coming up. In that era, it was mostly suburbia. And we were, as the, you just mentioned, making the kinds of investments in education that were critical. First, a big expansion of the K-12 through system. And second, the master plan that articulated the University of California, the state college system, and the community college system together. Stitching that together were two other key elements. One was an economy that was growing jobs in the middle. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a sort of uh, barbell economy with uh, some rich folks on one end and a large group of poor folks on the other. There were pathways to the middle class. Again, not always easy. Many of us had to fight our way in, but there were pathways to be there. And there was also a sort of social compact commitment to the next generation of Californians. What we argue in the book is that what eroded that was racism, 
that as people began to think that more people of color were also going to be part of the California future, a lot of the drawbridges got lifted up in terms of public investments and in terms of the racial propositions of the 1990s. What I think needs to happen, because I think we've worked our way through a lot of that demographic change, we've learned to value diversity, value immigrants, understand that the over-criminalization of black and brown youth is not a plus but a negative, that we need to then get back to some of the principles about what made us work. Investment, housing, you know, we need to really throw down on the education system, K through 12 to be sure. I think one thing that's absolutely key is the community college system. Just a personal note here, my dad, who actually came to the United States in the 1930s, was himself undocumented, garnered citizenship during World War II when he uh, was given a choice between being deported or joining the U.S. Army. He joined the U.S. Army and citizenship came with it. But he was a janitor, and he went to L.A. Trade Tech, a community college that I believe is in your district, Senator Mitchell. That it is. And L.A. Trade Tech, he learned about electricity, and he went from being a janitor to being an air conditioner repairman, and my family went from being poor to being working class. Mm -hmm. The community college system is central to that path to the middle of the labor market. The other two things that I think the, the next governor needs to do is to really think about not just celebrating the high-tech wealth of the state, but trying to figure out where advanced manufacturing can create the kind of jobs that will be important for people in the future. How do we devise successful reentry programs so people can find their path in terms of workforce development to really concentrate not on the glitter of high-tech, but on the gritty realities of the kind of middle-class jobs that people really need and to put our development resources in that. And then I think the next governor really needs to rearticulate the social compact, that we really are tied together. And I think in the state, one thing that's going to be really crucial about this is linking coastal California and inland California, because the divides are really growing, and that's going to be dangerous economically, politically, socially in the future. I'm going to push back on you just a little bit. How do they do that? I appreciate the book talks about California's period of real struggle with the race-based policies. And, you know, I have to say, as a city member of the legislature today, arguing issues before my colleagues on both the Senate floor in policy committee, I don't know that we have come full circle quite yet. There still is oftentimes resistance expressed about our criminal justice reform policies and perceptions of, quote, those people. Those are direct quotes taken from comments made on the floor of your California State Senate. And so I fully support and agree with all of your advice to the new administration. But are we really there? Is California, its residents, its current local leaders really ready to help this next administration take it to the next level when it comes to race? Well, we, we'd better be, and we're not. One of the things, when I talk about the book, I love to teach people a little Spanish phrase, se cree en muy muy, which literally in Spanish means he believes himself to be very, very, mm -hmm. meaning you're conceited. Yeah. So California, se cree en muy muy. Yes. Right? We are very conceited. Yes. You know? We're like, oh, my gosh, we raised the minimum wage, and we passed Prop 47, and we've got a sanctuary state. And, and we have the highest child poverty rate in the country. Yeah. <laughs> we've got tremendous homelessness, mm -hmm. right? Our housing prices are out of control. We're not growing jobs in the middle. We're de-incarcerating, but we're not investing in reentry programs that we need. There's so much more that we need to do. Now, I do think that this is a very different terrain than it was 25 years ago. And so I think acknowledging the positive steps that have moved forward and then understanding that we remain the fourth most unequal state in the United States, that we used to be in the middle of the pack in the 1960s, half the state's more equal, uh, more unequal. We've got a long way to go. In some ways, not all, we've got a lot of the politics right, but we haven't got a lot of the policies or the implementation right. And that, I think, is going to require real leadership, and it's going to require being honest to folks about the fact that in order to really make change, we're going to need to make sure we've got a stronger revenue base to be able to do this. One of the key things I think is going to be really crucial, it'll be interesting to see whether the next governor will lead on this, is how do we reform Prop 13? Mm -hmm. Prop 13 has been an Achilles heel 
for the finances of the state. Property taxes are a relatively stable base of taxes, particularly compared to our reliance on the income tax. We've got this tremendous essential giveaway to a lot of corporations over the years since Prop 13 passed, the share of property taxes being paid by homeowners relative to corporations has increased because corporations are able to not have the property change hands as frequently, at least in legal terms, and be able to keep their tax bills low. So I think reform of Prop 13 is going to be a really crucial struggle that's probably going to come up in 2020 as a ballot initiative, and will be very interesting to see where the next governor falls on that. And it has both real fiscal impacts and tremendous symbolic value because it's really the passage of Prop 13 that was the moment in which California's right-wing conservative forces were really achieving the beginnings of their triumph. And you give great credit and draw direct correlation to many of our more progressive successes in in the policy uh, arena to community-based stakeholders and to kind of outside agitation. And I think it's just those groups who really have, up to this point, push the envelope forward in terms of allowing all of us to take a critical, informed look at Prop 13. I tell folks all the time, I was not a voting age in 78, but even I remember my parents having conversations at the breakfast table, and their whole understanding was it was to help grandma keep her house and be able to afford her taxes. No one assumed it was going to help Walt Disney and Disneyland. Well, and we could have helped grandma keep her house by devising a tax plan that was limited to residential homeowners and that really tried to create special protections for seniors and for people living on fixed income. We should have fixed that problem with a scalpel, and instead we used a sledgehammer. And it turned out to be a lot like, and this is why, again, the parallels are so eerie. If you look at the Trump tax cut that got passed and is the signature achievement, quote-unquote, of the Trump presidency, it's basically going to give the middle class a very slight tax break, and it's a Trojan horse for giant relief for corporations. Boy, that sounds a lot like Prop 13. Doesn't it? Like I said earlier, deja vu all over again. Before I roll over to my last question, I just wanted to, you mentioned kind of the housing, and I appreciate your reference in the book to Byron Rumford. You know, he was a founding member of the California Legislative Black Caucus when he was elected to the Assembly in 1963. And your acknowledgement of the champion role he played in creating California's Fair Housing Act. And as we continue to deal with the new issue of the day, housing affordability across racial lines, I appreciate you including that piece of history in your book. That's a very critical element to California's history. You know, I think one of the things that those of us who try to understand why we're at where we are today is it's important to go back in that history and look at those heroes who really pushed the envelope in their era and to also look at what happened after he passed fair housing, which is that the voters in California passed something called Prop 14, which basically re-legalized segregation in housing, and that one of the champions of that proposition in the name of private property rights was Ronald Reagan, who then went on to run for governor based on the idea that you should protect private property rights against these overreaching liberals who want to get rid of your right to be able to sell or to restrict your sales to not include people of color. So, yes, he occupied a very, very important position, and that history needs to be revealed. You know, another thing that I think really lifts up in the book, and it's really great that you mentioned it, is the role of the community organizers. Because I think when people think about the change in California, they tend to think about Governor Brown being the architect of the whole shift. For example, the property tax reform that was Prop 30 was so deeply influenced by the organizing of community-based organizations that were willing to put their own initiative on the ballot and the ways in which all of the changes around criminal justice, around immigrant rights, around decriminalization, around the minimum wage, et cetera, around climate justice, these things have really come from community-based organizations who have dug in for the long haul, built a base, create an alternative vision, and done exactly what I started this interview with, what we should have done with Obama, which is to create the kind of community calculus that makes it possible for political figures to do the right thing. 
you're a person I like a lot and have a great faith in and I believe you will do the right thing. But I think it's going to be easier for you to do the right thing if people who are doing community organizing change the underlying political calculus to make it more possible and then to make it more possible for you to build allies. No question. And coming from a community organizing background, I think I'm a living example. And there's several of us in the legislature now who came from that background who are now elected who continue to work in partnership. Yes, and that's, by the way, I just want to say a really great thing about California has been that the sort of leap from protest to proposition, from community to elected leaders, the ability to play a kind of inside-outside game has been really critical. So in closing, uh, if I may, first of all, I have to tease you. I don't know what bone you have to pick with hot tubs. Hot tubs are a poor man's swimming pool. (laughs) What's wrong with you, Dr. Pastor? Don't mess around with me in my hot tub. Doctor, you never knew that that was going to be the issue she'd call out. That's right. Folks will have to read the book to get the inside joke. You thank your parents several places in the book, fundamentally for their move to California when you were six months old, and you dedicate the book to them and thank them. My question to you is, what will your children thank you for? Gosh, what a nice question. I think they're going to thank me for two things. One is for deeply loving and supporting them in whatever they want it to be. When I was growing up, there was pressure in me to perhaps be a, a good kid, but not to follow a particular career path. And for someone to come back to a working class family and say, I'm going to go get a PhD in economics so I can be an ally to community-based groups working for social justice, that didn't sound like a real career path. Turns out it's worked out pretty well. But, you know, I hope that my children, and I think they do, my son is a musician, my daughter a dancer, that they feel that love and support for whatever it is that they want to become. The second thing is I believe that they see me as a warrior, as someone who understands and have taught them that I've been blessed. You know, it's not just my own talent or energy that has allowed me to achieve what I've achieved. My parents worked hard. There was a civil rights movement that created affirmative action to take a chance on a kid like me to get into the university. There were unions to protect my dad's role at work. There were public schools that were the basis for my kind of education. And I've tried to help my children understand that our responsibility is to give back, to make change, because the question is not about whether or not somebody beats the odds. It's whether or not we team together to change the odds so that people can actually make successes in themselves, realize their dreams, and do that in collaboration with others. And I think my kids see me as a warrior. They also understand that they're blessed and lucky and that they're going to have to work with others to change the odds. So they got some pretty good politics. I like them a lot. Professor, I can't think of a better touchstone with that question and with that answer to wrap up this segment. Thank you so much for being with us on this podcast, and I hope our paths cross again and that we can talk to you a little bit more in the future about our state of resistance here in California. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for letting me be with one of my sheroes. <laughs> and that does close our discussion this time around. Uh, then there's California as a production of the California State Senate Democratic Caucus with technical and production assistance from Martin Ashley and Brian Shadden and George Soros from the state capitol in Sacramento. I'm Brian Green. And I'm State Senator Holly mitchell And thanks for listening, everybody. 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 Everybody.